Hello everyone, my name is David Matkin. I'm an associate professor in the Romney Institute of Public Service and Ethics in the Marriott School of Business at Brigham Young University. That's me up on your screen, and this is a short video in our department's impact series. If you're a Romney Institute alum and you don't recognize me, that isn't too surprising. As of this recording, I'm the newest member of the Romney Institute faculty, I've been teaching here now for two years. My areas of research and teaching are in public budgeting and financial management. In this video, we'll talk a little bit about financial fraud in public service organizations. We're going to do three things. First, we'll briefly cover some basic ideas about financial fraud. It's really a massive topic and it would take a lot more than just a short video to give it a full treatment. But we'll talk about some major points. Then we'll spend most of our time looking at an event of actual fraud from a few years back that resulted in over $600,000 reportedly of losses to school districts from across the nation. And then lastly, we'll just review a few basic practices that we can implement to avoid financial fraud in our organization. At the risk of oversimplifying, Fraud schemes tend to be most disruptive when the scheme takes advantage of the regular, legitimate ways that money flows in and out of an organization. If money is already flowing, the fraudster only has to find a way to redirect some of it. If that redirection is done artfully or the organization is not paying sufficient attention, then the organization may never even know that it failed to receive revenues that it rightfully earned or that it paid out money to illegitimate sources. When fraud is associated with financial inflows, the culprits often skim the resources before the funds ever hit the organization's books, or they alter internal records to hide stolen funds. These schemes are often performed, unfortunately, by highly trusted members of an organization. They appear in all other ways to be good citizens. They come to work early, they stay late, they don't take holidays, they cover for others. Often they've worked at the organization for many years, long enough to learn the weaknesses in the internal controls. When the fraud is associated with financial outflows, the perpetrator may be inside or outside the organization, or possibly both, someone on the inside and on the outside, like in a kickback scheme. Many of the fraud schemes developed by people from outside the organization look a lot like the email phishing schemes we see. They attempt to appear as legitimate clients or vendors, contractors, grant recipients, or etc., in an effort to trick the organization into sending them money. Among the most common variations of this scheme is when a fraudster mails a fake invoice with the hope that many organizations will pay without looking too closely. Here is an example of one of those types of schemes. What I'd like you to do is take a few minutes to look at this invoice Try to identify the elements of this invoice that signal to the reader that this is a legitimate vendor and a legitimate invoice. Also, try to pick out the breadcrumbs that would signal to an attentive reader that this invoice is a fraud. You can pause the video and look as long as you want at the invoice. Okay, first, what do we see that signals that this could be legitimate? Well, starting from the top, we have a physical address for the vendor rather than a P.O. box. So it appears that the business has a physical location. Then down the page a little bit, we see some specifics about the order, including a purchase order number. We are also provided a fair amount of detail about the book, including weight, page number, an ISBN number, we see that the shipping fee has been waived because the order is above the $300 threshold. And there's a friendly customer service oriented note at the bottom. So the basics are there, but there are also clear problems. For one, the formatting of the document is a little strange. At the top right corner of the page, toll, email, and FEIN should be lined up, but they're not. In fact, FEIN is on the same line as the email. Then the word details is spelled wrong here. Book details, the I 
is written out as an L. And down at the bottom, in the amount due, there are two decimal places between $647 and the 50 cents. The five looks weird too, but I'm not sure if that's just the copy of the document. Moving on from the appearance of the document, we could look at the substance as well. The company is called Scholastic School Supply, and I'm familiar with a company that's similar to that. That helps signal to me something of a legitimacy, but the actual company I'm thinking of is this one, Scholastic Corporation, with an EIN of 13-338-5513. Now back to the invoice, but that's a different company name than what we see on the invoice. And the FEIN is different. In fact, if we were to have searched the name of the company and the FEIN, we wouldn't have found this to be an actual company or that to have been a registered FEIN. Also, although we have a physical address listed here, if we do a Google search on that address, this address that was listed as the company's physical address was actually for a commercial mail receiving agent, essentially a service that re would receive mail and forward it on. Another breadcrumb is the email address, scholasticschoolsupply at usa.com. usa.com is an unlikely domain for a professional publishing company. So at this point, a critical reader should have fairly significant doubts as to whether the vendor sending this invoice is a real company or not. We could also look at the book information. The book information gives us an ISBN number, which, as we said earlier, signals a certain amount of legitimacy to the reader. But if we were to do a Google search on this ISBN number, we would not find it associated with the title of the book listed. In fact, the ISBN number is 11 digits long, and the standards for ISBN numbers is 10 digits or 13 digits. If we take all of this information together, we can see that this invoice is clearly fictitious. Maybe we would even doubt that anyone would possibly be fooled by this invoice. Let's finish up by asking, what can we do in our own organizations to protect against financial fraud? The first thing is to just pay attention. The invoice we just looked at is not a sophisticated fraud scheme. And yet, approximately a thousand school districts paid the invoice, sending the fraudster more than $600,000. This tells me that we all need to be just a little more aware, a little more vigilant, and a little more humble, recognizing that these kinds of schemes can happen to us. Another best practice is for organization leaders to publicly espouse and personally model a respect and appreciation for sound financial stewardship. Executives who create what we'd call a control environment are more likely to have employees that pay attention to the little things that end up preventing and or detecting fraud. And leaders who dismiss financial controls as inefficient and bureaucratic are likely to create a lax control environment where fraud is more likely to occur and less likely to be detected. Another essential practice is to work closely with an alert and energetic auditor. An alert auditor will help your organization identify flaws in your financial controls and maintain good financial hygiene. An alert auditor also keeps potential fraudsters on their toes and helps eliminate the temptation in the first place. The last recommendation is to build a solid system of financial controls. That means a lot of different things. It includes things like multiple signatures on checks and protecting passwords to important systems, reconciling bank accounts, not becoming overly reliant on any one person in the financial system. But importantly, it's also recognizing that while trust is, of course, essential to a good work environment, it's not a financial control. I hope this video has been helpful, spur some thoughts for you about financial fraud and some of the things that you might be able to do in your own organization to improve your financial hygiene and sharpen up some of the financial controls. Have a great day. I look forward to hearing from you.